We all know what irony is, right? It's when the actual meaning is the complete opposite from the literal meaning. Example? Wendy Crewson. She's probably best known for her distinctly American roles. Played the wife of a U.S. president. Played the love interest of a U.S. president. And played the girlfriend of a U.S. presidential candidate in the TV show Tanner 88. It's actually where she met her first real-life husband, actor Michael Murphy. Let's get married. Why not? There's no reason not to. Now, now here's the irony. Wendy's actually as Canadian as maple syrup poutine. Oh, God, that just sounds so good together. Born in Hamilton, raised in Winnipeg and Montreal, Wendy moved to the U.S. in the mid-80s and landed parts in some big studio pictures. I don't know who you are or what you want, but you will never get it. Then, after more than a decade south of the border, she returned to her home and native... Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. And you can currently catch her in the hit movie, The Vow, you know, The Vow, Rachel McAdams, Channing Tatum, they're pretty, they're handsome. You're in the hospital, you were in a car accident. I need pain. My head hurts. I'll get you something for that. Since her return, Wendy's become a tireless supporter of our homegrown film and TV industry and advocate for the rights of artists. In 1998, she played Sue Rodriguez, the BC woman with ALS, who fought the Supreme Court for the right to die. I want to be in charge of my life and my death. Wendy was inspired by Sue and became a champion of the ALS Society of Alberta, something she still devotes her time to today. And there's nothing ironic about that. Welcome, Wendy How are you? I'm good, George. How are you? Great. Nice to see you. Good. Nice to be here. Thanks. Of course. Welcome to the program. Thank you. What's going on? You're very busy. You have a lot on the go here. I'm busy. I'm busy You're these busy. days. I am indeed. I was just in L.A. actually to walk the red carpet for The Vow. No, it's right. See? Oh, oh, I know. Oh, it's let's... so fast. Look, it's Channing Tatum. We'll take his shirt off. Ah! Oh, no, stop. It's Rachel McAdams, right. who is so, so fantastic. They're all so The amazing. most beautiful woman alive, she's I think bad, she is. She's not bad, eh? She's really... She's not bad. The vow is the one thing, but also, if you think about the Terry Evanson character, right, mm -hmm. um, what is it about working with you that makes people lose their memories? You know what? It's head trauma. <laughs> it's working with me and head trauma. <laughs> you know, the nice thing about uh, Rachel was that it was a very pretty head trauma. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, because you don't want an unattractive head trauma for a big movie like hey, that. Hey, look, all, no. all head trauma is challenging and unattractive Exactly, as well. um, exactly. And, and, and going through your list, you clearly keep working and you seem to be moving forward, but when you get the women in film and television uh, recognition and they celebrate your body of work, do you mm -hmm. take time to reflect on the career you've had? Are you that sort of person? You know, no. I'm, I'm shallow and, and self-doubting at all times. <laughs> yeah, no, I just think, oh, there's I some I don't big believe you're mistake shallow. here. I don't believe you're shallow. Oh, really? But, yes, yeah, of course. No, but self-doubting, <laughs> you know, in the performing business, exactly. perhaps. Exactly. That's, that's part of, I think, the thing that feeds us. No, you always think that when, when they call you for something like that, oh, they've made a terrible mistake, it's not really me, somebody's backed out, I'm a last-minute choice. So, you know, you don't... I think it's hard to sort of look at yourself and sort of go, oh, yeah, but, but, but I have managed, as I say, to work through the years, so, you I mean, know. You've been lucky enough not to be typecast, except you are totally getting typecast as the first lady, because Tanner 88, um, mm -hmm. 24, right. and Air Force One, mm -hmm. you make out with the presidents. I endlessly am making out with the president. <laughs> that is so, I know, it's crazy. At any point did Bill Clinton call you and say... <laughs> If you want to try the real thing. Well, listen, no, but if Barack did. If Barack did, you would consider. <laughs> I would that. be there. Michelle will punch Michelle, you out if you, you know say what? that. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm only kidding, kidding. And but they always looked to, uh, I thought it was funny, a Canadian woman is, is the president's wife. Yeah, like you know? several times. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. Yeah, that is weird. Yeah. Uh, are there mm. roles that you've regretted taking? Uh, oh, I've done a, uh, several regrettable movies. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, but, but we just hide them. We don't even put them on the resume anymore. They just disappear. We find them. Oh, do you? Yeah, we and find them. And you've got some clips. Well, yeah, not right now. Okay, uh, fantastic. I mean, do you want to? We could play one clip, but I wouldn't, I no, wouldn't call this. No, no, no. This is not regrettable, though. Oh, this isn't. Roll it. Why it is illegal for someone to assist me to do something that is legal is a paradox I will never understand. But more to the point... It is a paradox which forces me to suffer greatly, both mentally and physically. That is not regrettable. That is an incredible choice. It's Sue Rodriguez, the anniversary of her passing was the 12th of February. Mm -hmm. You played um, in, Sue in, in, in a film, right? Talk about that experience. Well, that was a real life-changing experience. Um, you know, you can study acting for years and years, but when you get a role like that, you really understand what it actually means to put yourself in that position. And to play this woman, to have to be in a character with that disease, which had to be real, which had to be something, because people who have that disease will be watching that ALS, thing, yeah. yeah, saying, 
that's what that looks like, that's what that feels like. So the idea that you're able to put, walk in someone else's shoes for a while is the most remarkable experience. And that was the beginning of me really understanding what that felt like. And I was so moved by her story, so touched by what she went through, and then continued to be involved in the ALS Society afterwards. Yes, and yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's interesting, activism seems to be a part of your, your story. Was that always part of your DNA? Did it come through that experience? No, it was not always part. I was, no, shallow and selfish, completely non-political. You didn't say selfish. You said shallow and self-doubt earlier. We've added selfish okay. now? Okay, okay. Selfish, too. Selfish, <laughs> endlessly selfish. I had no idea sort of what it meant. I think it took a certain amount of maturity to come to these realizations that you're not sort of doing it all by yourself, you know, that it isn't all just about you. So it just sort of, you, you come to it through things like that. And through that specifically, that really, I felt my, it just opened my heart to all this sort of experience that was going on. And I felt, what can I do to give back now? What can I do to help out? How can I, how can I do that? So once you find out that your voice has the ability to resonate a little bit based on your profile and based on your career, do you then change how you approach your career. Do you look at, do you look for roles where you can make statements? Do you think an artist has to do that? I didn't know they don't have to do that at all, but certainly that is one of the benefits of, of being in that position, that you can change minds and open hearts and uh, hopefully create a little compassion. I think that's part of the sort of advocacy that I do for Canadian culture, for especially for television. Um, is that it's the idea that we need to see our stories so that the, these stories on television, this hugely powerful medium, has the ability to change people's mind. It has the ability to illuminate things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of, to make us, to give us compassion, to help us understand what that must be like to be the other person. And so I think that, that more and more, of course I choose, I hopefully choose those kinds of roles, but you also do other ones. Sure. You got to pay the rent, right? Yeah. So it's. You but know. you also want to be able to have a, to kind of experience the, the myriad of options in your career, right? Absolutely. We we talk so much about how important the railroad was in connecting this country, mm -hmm. but this network and the idea of this telling stories. This is the intellectual and the emotional railroad of this country that goes to every town when done properly. But why is it seemingly difficult to get Canadians to want to hear their stories? Because Canadian films open, mm -hmm. and people don't always go. No. They don't always go. So what happens is in 1999, the CRTC, which is our regulatory board, lifted regulations on private broadcasters on the amount of Canadian programming that they had to show in primetime hours. So at the promise that they would, of course, air Canadian drama, don't make us do it, we're going to do it, don't worry, there'll be even more, there was none. So we went to having 12 one-hour series to having zero. Right. It all fell out. All Canadian content now is cooking and gardening shows that go on in the morning that don't cost anything to make, and they just pump in simulcast American broadcasting on, on all our primetime hours. So what we're looking for here is a little bit of shelf space for those Canadian stories because I do think they can be popular. So Canadian shows, so if you look at, I mean, you can take any number of examples from recently Flashpoint, Republic of Doyle that's doing so well, the Arctic Air now that's doing well, that old, uh, Da Vinci's Inquest, A Corner Gas, all these shows that have been done can find an audience. But if you continually sort of push Canadian things into the background, what starts to happen is that people are conditioned to turning on their television and seeing American products sitting there. Right. We need to give more shelf space and allow people to find it in prime time hours on our dial. The model exists in radio. In radio, you have to play X amount of Canadian content, but the way yeah. the CRTC works it is you have to play it from 6A to 6P, 6A to 6PM, same amount, yeah. and from 6PM to midnight, you have to play you can't get a wise, as they called it, exactly. the content. Exactly, the content. And what has happened with that? Our Canadian artists have become worldwide successes. For sure. So our musicians now, we're respected worldwide for our musicians. We don't have great musicians and great authors and, and great painters and don't have good you know, writers and, and TV actors and shows. Yeah. That's not how it works. Of course, we have um, great talent in this country, but it needs the shelf space in order to be seen. We are certainly great storytellers. Uh, Wendy's also worked with some of uh, some unbelievable people in the past, including some real surprising ones. We're going to get into that oh. anthropology with Wendy when we come back. <laughs> I'm Glacia the fighter. I have great strength and courage, strong armor, many weapons, and I've won the mighty talking sword of Lothia. I am part you, a holy man. 
In reaching the ninth level, I have acquired many magic spells and charms, the greatest of which is the Graven Eye of Timur. But I also have a sword, which I only use should my magic fail me. Amazing <laughs> monsters. That's 1982, you, Chris Makepeace, and a very young Tom Hanks. <laughs> and Tom Hanks, exactly. Right. That was, oh, that was so much fun. My, he was fantastic and so smart and funny, and you just knew he was going to be a huge yeah, star. I remember seeing him on Family Ties, and you knew that Uncle Ned was going to become something. He did Booze and Buzzy. The, but, booze and Buddies. But, 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 booze and Buddies. Yeah, yeah, there's an yeah. energy that's in these people. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So here's the thing. Uh -huh. Yes, you worked with Tom Hanks, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rachel mm -hmm. Channing Tatum, mm -hmm. oh, yes, fabulous. Can we play this clip here, though, because oh, I need your comments dear, on this. Dear, dear. So I don't have a goddamn case without the goddamn gun. The fingerprints, the ballistics, everything. I have to have the gun. That murdering piece of slime is gonna go free without the 44. How the can they lose it? There are a lot of great people in that clip. You were in a movie with Tupac Shakur. I was in a movie with Tupac. Tupac's last film. Uh, his, I know, his very last, which was just uh, unbelievably tragic because he was the most, I had no idea who he was. Okay, I'm a mom at the time, I got two little kids. They said, who's in this movie? I said, oh, it's some guy named, with, like, named Two Boxes or something. <laughs> I I'm like, I had no idea who he was. Wait, you tell but, me you weren't walking around singing All Eyes on Me? You weren't singing like the Tupac <laughs> Rainbow No, I was like deep into sort of diapers and babies, yeah. and I was like completely oblivious to the world. We sat on set. Um, it was um, Jim Belushi, Tupac, myself. We would sit on set singing songs from South Pacific. R Tupac. Tupac. See, he was always an art school student. Yeah, he was. He was always he was. an art school student. Exactly. Yeah, a sweet, baby-faced, lovely guy. It was unbelievably tragic. He, um, yeah, he died not long after that. Yeah, um, yeah what, what, a couple what, months. Yeah, when you heard that, what, what was going through we your head? Were sh couldn't believe it. Just shocked. Just absolutely shocked. What was the rap party like with Tupac Shakur? <laughs> You know, I again, I was, I had baby. I didn't go to any rap parties. Oh I'm so gosh. sorry. I know. But the first day a we were on a rap party with a rap guy. Guy, I, mean... I know, I know. What was I thinking? But <laughs> the first day, the first day we were rehearsing, and he came on to set, and he had this little like, little singlet on, and all these chains hanging out. I thought, oh my! I said that wardrobe is fantastic. He goes, uh, these are my clothes. <laughs> I know. And, right. <laughs> And they're fantastic too. So you've played a lot of doctors, you've played a lot of crusaders, and you've mm -hmm. played a lot of activists. Do you ever just want to get a role where you just play a jerk? You know what? Now Evil Queen is next, right? Yeah. Right. Can't wait. Well, Once Upon a Time's got a great Evil Queen exactly. in it, right? Exactly. Evil Queens are in style now, That's and I've role? been practicing for years. So would you ever play with my <laughs> kids? What's a better experience, spending one day on set of CSI or one day on set of The Littlest Hobo, of which you've done both? A Littlest Hobo, yeah. definitely, yeah. When you're on Littlest Hobo, are you aware that you're in the presence of like one of seven of the most iconic dogs ever? Yeah, there were there were a lot of them. Yeah. But the guy always screaming, down, Bone, down! <laughs> he just screaming at the poor dog. Dude, yeah. Megan Follows said the exact same thing. The yeah. guy was a yeller. Yeller. You're always like jumping on set of screaming at the dog. Who's someone you'd like to say sorry to? Uh... My kids. Why? Oh, way a lot. You know, showbiz mom. My daughter said in preschool, when asked what I do, she pretends to be other kids' moms. Yeah, right? That, that was hurt. sad. That, that hurts, hurt. right? That hurt, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so then what do you do about that? You know, therapy. A lot of therapy. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we're very close now. Right. We've worked really hard at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are you aware that you being away has had an impact on them? They claim now that I wasn't away that much, that it was fine, and they had a great time, and Michael Murphy, so, yeah. you know. It was, it was Who you a, met as well. I met Tanner. on a show, I met on Tanner, exactly. It's gotta be so fun. Can I show you a photograph and ask for your comments on this? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's go to this picture. I don't have my glasses on. Okay, anyway. so Where's you win a... Oh! Oh, yeah. You don't need glasses to see that. I don't need glasses to see that. You win a Gemini Award, and you make out with Ian Hannah Man Singh. Ian or we call Handsome Man Singh. Handsome Man Singh, that's Woo! right. Yeah, so. Ian. Okay, well, it had been Adrian Brody who just kissed Halle Berry on right. the thing, so I thought, oh, wouldn't this be funny that I would do this? I approach, Ian, I run up, I grab him like this, I go to kiss him, his look on his face is like this. <laughs> I think, oh, my God. Was that, uh, was that his man. look of consent? No, that was the look of, do not touch me. Who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> I just, I thought, there's somebody I need to say sorry to. Ian, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Dude, he can say that I made out with Wendy Cruz, and I think he's, he's no, just I fine with that. I don't know. He was, so if you win an Oscar, who would you want to make out with? 
Who, who would I want to make out with if I won an Oscar? Gee, the, the statue itself would, would be, be nice. yeah, mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can see her in The Vow now with uh, Channing and also, of course, with Rachel and so many others is in theaters. It's great to see you, Wendy. Great to see you, Thank you, so Thank you George. Thanks, Thanks so much. Time. We'll be right back. So